Uh, okay, my name is Dr. Hussain. I'm the Uh, the the forum is yours. Thank you. And just checking, you can see my slides. Yeah, we can see your slides, Dr. Erdman. Perfect. So this presentation is about how a distributed ledger platform has been used by Scotland's Rural College and pioneering Aberdeenshire farmers who have recently formed uh, the Oat Co. Um, so they formed it because of concerns over food and drink safety. Um, and authenticity um, and consumers uh, have been wanting increasingly transparent and trusted evidence about the life cycle of products. So the OCO farmers um, have been collecting information about their oats. Um, their oats are gluten free, um, but to a lower level than is currently required in the UK for um, uh, getting the kite mark. So in the UK, that's 20 parts per million. In the rest of the world, it tends to be five parts per million. Um, and that lower level uh, is really what people with celiac disease want to be able to see. That higher level of 20 parts per million can often uh, cause uh, their illness to flare up. So the oat co farmers are already recording various processes and actions uh, that they are taking in their fields, in their sheds, um, with spraying and harvesting. But of course, they're really only doing that on paper or in farm management systems at the moment, which is time consuming and outdated. They have a purpose built mill um, and their process uh, that they have got on paper is certified gluten-free and certified BRCGS. So they have to do extra testing for that five parts per million gluten-free uh, to assure uh, celiac disease sufferers. But they also are making records about the machinery, the storage, the product as it's stored, when it's bagged, um, and they approached us to uh, help us think about, help them think about how they could provide an assured traceability tool for the oats, which was digital and trustable. So we came up with a plan to assure the information that they were collecting and the data that the OCO had. Um, about uh, making it tamper-proof, making it digitally available, and making it available in a nuanced way to those who needed to see it. So we bought in a distributed ledger technology platform company, um, and we were uh, part of the network of uh, distributed, um, part of that distributed network and able to be the verifiers of the data that the farmers were uploaded. So at this stage, we've just completed the proof of concept stage, the area in the dotted red box, but the OCO are busy um, approaching food processors and uh, big retailers. So we're hoping that the project moves to a next stage all along the supply chain that you can see here right along uh, to those uh, products being available to uh, customers who've bought the oats in the shop. So we used um, this uh, distributed ledger technology platform called SICA. Um, it's a private and permissioned DLT network uh, used by many pilots in the public sector here in uh, Scotland. And um, the ledgers, the um, shared digital records are permissioned with proof of authority. So that means that one party might be able to write to a part of it. Perhaps another two parties might be able to read that written data, but another party doesn't have permission to necessarily write or read uh, anything. So granting nuanced permissions was really important um, because that was what we needed the data verifiers to be able to trust. So we really um, wanted to set up a controlled and secure process. 
Um, and of course, everybody in the network can only upload uh, and add data according to the specific permissions they've been granted. So as the group, the farmers, the independent academic verifiers and technology providers, we first kind of worked out the logic model on a spreadsheet, just thinking about what digital information was going to be required to prove that the oats were gluten free at each step. And of course, steps in farming are things that happen throughout the life cycle of a product as it grows. So in terms of a gluten free oats assurance process, we needed to gather data about the history of what had happened in the fields before the oat seed was even drilled into it and before the harvest was cultivated. The steps then, of course, have responsible actors. So which organisation does what? Well, the farmer does those first steps, but we needed to consider what digital evidence was required to prove those actions had been taken. And we needed the field history records. And of course, they sit in a farm management system. So that uh, meant that we had to be sure that we could get that digital asset out of that closed system and into the ledger and we could they could be exported as pdf the actual mapping of the process that we developed with the oak company looked more like this and this brought up a problem it it brought up something that we ended up calling sub steps and um, their child steps of a bigger parent step but it's data that needs to be collected. Um, and these steps happen many times. So cultivating happens many times because it's the application of fertilizer um, and a crop uh, might get, uh, in any different harvest might get cultivated a number of times. Alternatively, a crop in a field block might become contaminated um, by gluten halfway through the process. Perhaps it's growing next to a field of barley and it's been very windy in a certain direction. So we had to make sure that we could uh, finish um, uh, the, um, the logic steps uh, early if we needed to. So that taught us a big lesson that supply chains and chains of custody don't necessarily work in a linear order. In real life, things go backwards, multiple things happen simultaneously. And so uh, we ended up using directed acyclic graph architecture uh, in SICA rather than the more linear blockchain architecture to enable us to build records that through time could be more flexible and uh, reflect the chain of custody. With the project, we proved that we could use DLT to track and trace products back to source using the DLT platform. And the DLT platform could prove that those certain qualities had happened through the data that had been uploaded to the ledger. So the data was given permission in some cases to be public. And uh, if you have a phone, uh, you can um, take a picture of that uh, QR code. That QR code is um, effectively pulling with an API uh, from the ledger the data that's uh, allowed to be shown uh, to the public. You can do it now. Uh, the um, the camera app will ask your browser if it wants to go to a web app. So that allows consumers to trace their oats back along the supply chain. At the moment, the QR code is on packaging that the farmers are selling in their own farm shop. We've got that short supply chain um, just through their own processes. But that proof of concept and the app really attracted a good deal of press coverage. We had one international story by the BBC, one national newspaper report, two regional and four sector press stories. We also made a tech demo video, which was really useful for um, knowledge transfer with the uh, sector itself. And you can watch that with that URL um, on the picture there. 
And then um, we also had a paper in the JBBA um, presenting how qualitative research design and methodologies could help companies and academics achieve practice, uh, evidence-based practice. So that was a case study in the PCIO framework as proposed by NACB and Hussein last year as the most appropriate framework for evidence-based practice. The case study is the conclusion of the pilot project and we ran it as participatory action research or PAR. And the findings in our case study showed that PAR is an appropriate qualitative research method for any democratic collaborative consortia to achieve evidence-based practice through dialogue, through discussion, through co-development and trusting relationships. And the paper won best research paper in the public sector life sciences category just at the end of 2020. So what's next? Well, we're considering um, and seeking funding for future developments. As I mentioned earlier, that does include the idea of integrating Internet of Things sensors as actors in the network and enabling APIs from softwares. Uh, from, say, the farm management systems to be actors in the network. We want to be able to automate the uh, data, but also um, make sure that we're strongly authenticating that data into the network as well. We will probably extend the data collection and verification across a, a longer supply chain as the farmers uh, get to uh, that point as they deal uh, with food processors and um, retailers. And of course, we're seeing consumers being increasingly more interested in the idea of carbon emissions and carbon sequestration that, that farms can do. So other environmental data we expect to be adding to the ledgers too. So thanks very much for listening to my presentation. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, uh, Dr. Edman, uh, just two questions. Uh, what is the biggest uh, challenge uh, on the ground when it comes to agricultural related challenges? For example, you mentioned contamination of product is one of the biggest challenge. What other challenges uh, do you expect yeah. apart from this one? The um, one of the challenges we had was around usability. So um, if you're expecting a tractor driver to take, to give you some digital data about uh, what they've done, they really need to be able to use the device that they've got on them, which is usually their mobile phone, to take a picture of the fact that they've just cleaned meticulously um, their trailer or, or their tractor. So um, certainly... Um, you know, you can't expect them to use web apps. You can't expect them to, um, uh, sorry, web applications on computers, but you can expect them to use mobile apps. And we need to do a lot more of that uh, improving usability. Hmm. And, uh, well, uh, you have mentioned that uh, we are at the initial stages in, in proof of concept stage. It has to reach to the the supply chain and then to reach to the consumer stage. Uh, assume you overcome all the challenges. Uh, I know it is going to be a very uh, hard work. Uh, how long you think this project could be a reality when people, common consumer, have access to gluten-free product and which is verifiable uh, on mm -hmm. their mobile app? Um, I mean, we're hoping to be able to begin to integrate sensors, um, so their IoT hardware and then APIs from farm management software. Um, and we've we've got ideas about how that can be done, but of course we haven't proved that. So effectively, we have to go through a second proof of concept to prove that those actors can be in distributed ledger uh, networks and that we can authenticate their data onto the ledger. Um, but we do have one funded project starting later uh, this year, and we're hoping uh, to hear about uh, another one shortly. So hopefully that can that can start soon. Um, I mean, obviously, there are uh, use cases out there 
um, using, say, platforms like IBM's Food Trust, um, which um, the bigger supermarkets in the US, like Walmart, um, are are undertaking. So there are emerging um, uh, stories in production, um, but yes, we're still at proof of concept with this one. Excellent. Thank you very much. You. Our next speaker is uh, Adam Hayes. Uh, for his next talk, Adam, are you ready? Hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So I'm going to start with a, a poll. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Dr. Rodman have to uh, stop sharing her screen. Ah. Okay, so I have a poll going in the conversations for the session. While uh, I go pull up my... Dr. Rodman, could you stop sharing your screen, please, so Adam can can take the screen? Yeah, I have clicked that button. Yeah, good. Oh, we can see you, Adam, now. We can see you. Great. So, my talk today isn't actually a use case per se, except that it's interrogating the actual the original use case of Bitcoin, which is that of being a global internet money, or what I'm calling a world money. And today I want to sort of flip the script on this, uh, as it were, and and try to see if we can instead understand cryptocurrencies in, as a money world, which I'll explain what I mean by that. But in doing so, uh, it'll kind of help us think about cryptocurrencies as money at a different scope and scale, uh, and perhaps um, sidestep some arguments and debates about the moneyness of, of Bitcoin today. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from um, a paper that I that I've written on this topic. So the question of cryptocurrency's so-called moneyness, this has remained elusive. In fact, very few commercial or retail transactions still occur using cryptocurrencies even more than a decade after their introduction. And when they do, these digital tokens are often immediately converted back into local currencies by merchants. Uh, they don't want exposure to volatility or exchange rate risk, uh, especially with the price volatility of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies over the past several years. And even if they did have such a stomach for risk taking, merchants remain hard pressed to find eager business partners or vendors or suppliers among whom they can pass these coins along to as part of their day-to-day -day operations. So cryptocurrencies in practice indeed appear to behave not like money, but instead almost like a novel asset class or a virtual commodity or perhaps a collectible. So, um, as I said, I'm going to attempt to reframe the view of cryptocurrencies as money. So if Bitcoin, et cetera, are supposed to be this global internet money, they're certainly not used by one. Instead, it's become a speculative plaything, making up an alternative investment segment, expanding the universe of assets available to a well-diversified portfolio. And indeed, we know that these are hoarded. So collectors of cryptocurrencies tend to hold on for dear life or hodl them uh, rather than use them in exchange. And again, this makes it not like money. So we need to understand that money, it's not only use in exchange. So thinkers going back to the ancient times have kind of under, understood in different ways what makes something money. And this is the idea of moneyness. And Modern day economists have kind of taken over with this mainstream idea that it's use in exchange as this way to grease the wheels and uh, you know the money is a veil that all it does is make um, the real economy of production and services of goods and services uh, easier. And it solves this barter uh, potential problem of the double coincidence of wants. Well, that's not necessarily how people have thought about money throughout history. And indeed, money has existed without a medium of exchange as a numeraire or as this unit of account. And if we take the idea that money is a standard measure of value across time and space, 
the same way that meters are a standard measure of length and kilograms are a standard measure of weight, that we could say that monetary units or this unit of account is a standard measure of value. And therefore, if we don't have something like dollars or euros, which we have things to price with, um, or which we price things with, then we don't have a medium of exchange to transmit that value, and we don't have a store of value because we don't know what we're storing. So indeed, um, I'm starting with the premise that the unit of account is first and foremost what makes something money, and then the other functions of exchange as a medium and as a, a, a value store come after the fact. So if we think about that, then we can ask, well, is Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, are these world monies? And in fact, no, because they are not the media, uh, rather the unit of account anywhere. Even if people use them in exchange, they're still pricing things in their home currency. So if I buy something online and use Bitcoin, I'm still referencing the dollar value of that. So I'm gonna use a toy example here to the question of when or where is Monopoly money money, it can become a little more obvious that in the game of Monopoly, in the social construct of an instance of a Monopoly game, Monopoly money is indeed money. It's the unit of account, which everything on that board is priced in. It's the medium of exchange that's used when you land on a board piece that's owned by somebody. They charge you rent that's priced in Monopoly money. And uh, indeed, if you run out of Monopoly money, you lose the game because you are bankrupt. If you were then to take out your wallet and use euros or dollar notes to try, uh, you know, US dollar notes to try to buy your way back into the game, that would be cheating. And the friends you're playing with might think you're a bit of a jerk for doing so. But the fact is that Monopoly money, money within the social construct of the game is the money of the land and it's the unit of account. Other money, is not useful there. The same way that you cannot go to a restaurant and try to pay for something with monopoly money, it's not useful there. So fiat currencies are the unit of account bounded by political and geographic borders, okay? So when is a yen money? Yen is money in the context of the nation state of Japan. So we can then ask the question, when or where is Bitcoin money? Where are things priced as priced in terms of Bitcoin, and that is within the Bitcoin network. The blockchain itself is the social and technological construct within which bit, their salary, as it were, is in terms of Bitcoin, both in fees, but also block reward. But indeed, when people are transacting money on the Bitcoin blockchain as a medium of exchange, they can only send Bitcoin through the Bitcoin network. You cannot send other units of currency. Uh, you cannot send dollars to the Bitcoin network, for example. Therefore, Bitcoin is money within the Bitcoin blockchain. It's bounded by the so social and technological space. Now, this the, the Bitcoin blockchain is, is kind of a simple one commodity economy. It's not very interesting in economic terms, although it's certainly important and valuable. But we can look to uh, other blockchains for example, Ethereum. And Ethereum, the unit of account, is Ether. Ether is what everything is priced in within the social and technological boundaries of the Ethereum blockchain. And as a result, everything that takes place on that blockchain that's priced in Ether is considered or can be construed as economic activity. So let's take the silly case of CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties involve smart contracts that create these... Um, which is non-fungible tokens, which is now this hot word. But basically, each of these CryptoKitty cards are unique and have a uh, ownership that is unique. So if you own a CryptoKitty, it is yours. But the fact is that you pay for them using, um, using Ether units. They're priced in Ether. If you want to sire CryptoKitty, so in other words, if you have one, you can have it mate with another one so that you can have mutations and, and uh, heredity. So you can make a brand new unique CryptoKitty that has new and unique features that might be valuable for some people. That siring service is paid for in Ether. Ether is money. Ether is money, but only inside of the Ethereum blockchain. We can see how this works using schematics. So this is a schematic that 
the Ethereum uh, website actually has. But if you look at these uh, instances of where gas is needed, so gas are um, is the terminology used for bits of token, bits of ether token that are used to process the computational power of the mining network to validate transactions, but also to validate and process scripts such as smart contracts and indeed smart property like crypto kitties. So when we see this gas input and gas output, these are all priced in ether. Ether is the unit of account. It is the medium of exchange and you need to hold on to it. You need ether as a store of value so you can use it in the future. Everything is priced in ether units. So it is money, but it's no good outside of the country, the nation state, the social technological boundary of the Ethereum blockchain. And this way we can think of each blockchain as its own money world, just the way that the United States and Canada and Mexico and Eurozone, these are also money worlds. But these money worlds are now increasingly interacting with each other the same way that I can have cross-border commerce between the United States and Canada or with the Eurozone. You can now affect atomic swaps. These cross-blockchain swaps are essentially international trade, if you want to think of it that way. And so instead of thinking about each cryptocurrency or each blockchain-based token in our world, in the real world of human beings and the real production economy of things like chairs and, and, uh, and mining for raw materials that we use in production, instead we need to think of these as their own self-contained money world. So cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, et cetera, are not competing with US dollars and with euros on their own terms. No, indeed they're competing in terms of economic activity. So when we think of the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin is valuable because Bitcoin provides an economic service for this ecosystem. In that case, Bitcoin tends to be this reserve currency or, or settlement layer, uh, sort of like the way that dollars have been in the modern economy. But the fact is, is that each exchange rate, relative exchange rate is going to be based on certain things that are uh, inherent to the economic activity, if we can call it that, that occurs within these blockchains. And so cryptocurrency money as money worlds or blockchain based tokens as money worlds um, might become more and more relevant with the Internet of Things as computers and uh, algorithms make use of these tokens, for example, to affect micro auctions or to, um, well, look, micro auctions are a great example because human beings don't care about fractions of a cent and we're too slow to even make the calculations necessary. So if we're in a world of driverless cars and two cars need to negotiate who's gonna get on the entry ramp first on a highway, well, human beings fall back on social norms and rules of the road, but machines don't do that. But they can use a token to affect a micro auction, in which case that micro auction would use a denomination that is a money within that system. Anyway, the idea that, I, that I'm trying to leave us all with is that we've been thinking about the scale, perhaps, of cryptocurrencies all wrong. Cryptocurrencies are not this transnational borderless money, uh, world money. that are operating inside of it. And with that, I will end, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Excellent, uh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, just a simple question you mentioned about these uh, socio-economical boundaries. When do you think these boundaries or boundary walls uh, will collapse and they will become a one joint, uh, home or house or village uh, where these atomic swaps and similar technology will be uh, widespread and accepted globally? Well, that's the whole point. I don't think we should be thinking of it in those terms. It's not that 
one day everyone's going to be using Bitcoin as money because Bitcoin's only money inside of Bitcoin. And Ethereum is only money inside of Ethereum. Just the same way that, you know, if you've ever played an immersive video game, an online game, let's say World of Warcraft Gold, that's only useful within the game of World of Warcraft. Of course, there can be exchange between and among different money worlds, the same way that I can exchange US dollars for euros, but I can't use my dollars in Europe, right? So I can't use my dollars in Ethereum, uh, that money world, but I can buy Ether using dollars as, an ex as a foreign exchange. So I don't think there will be a time when um, all money worlds dissolve into one place, the same way that you know, even when you have the European Union um, and you've dissolved all currencies into the common euro, you have problems with that. Um, I think one thing that's interesting about this space is that anyone can create their own money world if they have a little bit of technological, uh, you know, computer coding skill and some uh, economic acumen to some degree. You can create a money world and that will succeed or fail on its own merits. Um, but at the same time, each money world you can create for its own specific purpose. So for example, if you have something like storage or file coin, that's a unit of account specifically targeted at file sharing and storage across computers. So you might have this idea of like Ricardian comparative uh, advantage where you have certain tokens that are useful for certain use cases and others that um, are incompatible with that use case, which is why you need something like Bitcoin, which is this universal settlement layer. Good. Uh, Adam, uh, this gentleman called Ben Yang uh, from uh, uh, Alliance Global Investors. His question is, how would one then be able to ascertain the valuation of each token in, in each ecosystem? Yeah, well, this is, is it, oh, is, the, is, that, is there more to the question? Yes, all using Bitcoin as the base reference currency. Well, I don't think that's necessary in, in, down the road. The same, well, you can have foreign exchange that doesn't use the dollar. For example, you can convert Australian dollars for New Zealand dollars directly. So there, I think there's plenty of room for um, not using Bitcoin as the reference. But what I, I, I would say is that um, the same way that in the, but before we had the, the Bretton Woods, uh, agreement, all countries for the most part were on some sort of gold standard and by standard simply meaning that the unit of account used in each country was linked to a specific weight of gold. So gold became this reference for all units of account, even though different countries uh, were pricing things in, for example, pounds, um, which, which historically was a pound of silver uh, versus, you know, a lira in other countries. But all of these were based on weights of gold. Instead, I think there will be weight, um, weights of, of uh, Bitcoin, for example. And did I miss the first half of that question? No, that's answered. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, Dr. Rodman, there is a question from a gentleman called Patrick. He is the owner of Innovation Doorway. I asked you about the future, but his question is about the past. He is asking, which challenges have you faced in order to come to a POC, number one? Which hurdles did you have to overcome? Mm. Yes, we, um, we, we had to overcome um, which data we could make um, digital. Um, so that was the biggest challenge to overcome. Um, and of course, you know, and then in the future, we're thinking about how we can make data more digitally native to start with, uh, so that it then is far easier to get into the ledger to to be the account of, of what's happened. So I would say that was the biggest challenge. And as a second part is which challenges have you faced in order to come to to come to a, a POC? Um, the technical challenge of choosing a distributed ledger uh, technology platform um, and then um, just working out how that that data 
uh, then gets nuanced permissions uh, into the DLT network. So those are the main um, main problems we had to overcome. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, Adam and, and Dr. Redman. Uh, very nice and constructive talk. Uh, we are concluding our session here. Uh, the audience, if they want to ask more questions, they can leave uh, in the forum. They will be answered uh, later. Thank you very much, Thank and you. we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.